China welcomes business and tech leaders from more than 100 countries and regions to summer Davos. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. More than 1,700 government and industry leaders gathered in China's coastal city of Dalian this week for the World Economic Forum's 15th annual meeting of the New Champions. This year's theme was Next Frontiers for Growth. Chinese Premier Li Cheng addressed the conference on Tuesday, stressing the importance of global cooperation and innovation to drive economic growth. Discussion centered on China's economy, artificial intelligence, and green technology. China has long been recognized as sort of a very uh, high growth and important consumer market. China is just really important uh, to the world and I think the world really is sort of depending on China to, to um, help the global economy kind of recover from some of the shocks that it's experienced over the last few years. Well, for more now on the summer Davos, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Beijing is Aina Tangen. He's a senior fellow with the Taihe Institute and founder and chair of Asian Narratives. Also with us, Andy Mok is a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization in Beijing. From Dalian, Chang Wa Wu is the chair of the governing council at the Asia Pacific Water Forum. And John Quelch is the executive vice chancellor of Duke Kunshan University. He also attended the forum in Dalian. Welcome to all of you. John Quelch, uh, China's economy was a big part of the discussions that took place uh, in Dalian. These talks, of course, taking place at a time when economies in both developed countries as well as developing countries are facing headwinds. Um, but if we look at China, the World Bank raised China's growth outlook for 2024 from 4.5% to 4.8 percent. What was the message you heard uh, from the delegates at Dalian? Well, thank you very much, Anand. Uh, Premier Li made a very uh, strong and uh, bold presentation uh, around the theme of new frontiers of growth. As you indicated, uh, he focused on um, green technology, he focused on uh, biomedicine, and he focused on artificial intelligence as three key pillars uh, for new growth drivers, uh, not just within China, but within uh, the global economy, because uh, a large part of the theme, as you might expect at the World Economic Forum, was on China-led uh, global cooperation in driving science and technology innovation. And uh, there was, I think, a uh, an interesting underlying theme uh, that suggested that uh, some of the uh, protectionist uh, measures that um, uh, legacy economies, the United States and Europe, have imposed on uh, Chinese uh, imports and uh, collaborative uh, uh, research and so forth, uh, that those are, uh, in a sense, old-fashioned uh, themes that are holding back global economic growth and um, Premier Li, I think, boldly presented China as uh, the uh, uh, the leader in the free market economy. And John, these uh, you mentioned three pillars, new growth drivers that you talk about. How much of a change is this for China as it as it charts its way into the future? So Ch China is very transparent through its five-year plan process, very transparent in terms of what its intentions and ambitions are. Uh, it has to be transparent because uh, uh, these messages from Beijing are then transferred down to the provinces and local governments who invest accordingly. And what we've seen, for example, Anand, in the area of green tech, is that uh, uh, in the so-called big three areas of photovoltaic uh, solar cells, uh, electric vehicles and lithium batteries, uh, Chinese companies having uh, been signaled by the government 10 years ago to uh, drive those uh, innovations uh, have in fact now become the major suppliers uh, in the world economy of those products. So I think uh, that gives you a sense of how determined uh, the Chinese uh, are to uh, develop uh, innovation that is addressing 
global pain points in this particular case, uh, climate change uh, and carbon emissions. And that is really, I think, the main uh, driver of the, the speech as I took it away, took away from Premier Li, that China is here to deliver right. to solve global problems. Anna Tangen, uh, talking about Premier Li's speech to the conference, uh, he also emphasized China's commitment to further opening up. He said, uh, Premier Li said, and I'm quoting him directly, he said, only through open interactions, exchanges, and mutual learning can we keep pushing the boundaries of development and discover and open up new frontiers. In many ways, the depth of international cooperation determines the height of human development. I know what were your main takeaways from this conference? Uh, <clears throat> well, that was a counterpoint, obviously, to uh, small yards and high fences, uh, which you know China obviously does not believe in. Um, there is a sense that the world has to go forward together. Uh, you're seeing a, s a sharp division between uh, the, de the developed, uh, pr previously mostly colonial states, and the rest of the world. Uh, China is relying more and more heavily on uh, markets that uh, are outside the, the traditional ones of Europe and the United States. And that is probably going to continue, given the uh, amount of you know, sturm und drang that's happening in domestic politics, whether it's the U.S., U.K., Europe, or uh, anywhere else. So, yeah, I, I think he, he wants to make sure that there is a positive uh, message. The issues here are confidence and uh, predictability. Uh, right now, uh, with uh, things, especially all these elections, changes in policies, it is very hard for business people to invest because they don't know what's going to happen. He's trying to assure them at least that China will do its part. Remember, 30 percent of global growth last year came from China, and you can expect about the same this year. Chang Wu, there were also uh, calls in Dalian for increased international collaboration to address the challenges of energy transition, to make the move towards uh, green energy, towards green technology uh, in the battle against climate change. What can you tell us about this? I think that all the number and evidence, uh, you know, as presented, shared uh, in Dalian here at the Summer Davos, uh, are all just fascinating, encouraging to see the progress that's made already. The, you know, all the milestones that China has been leading, has made. Uh, pretty much China has been on a solid track or pathway to deliver the commitments in the last, particular last decade or so, because we started really to focus on new and emerging, uh, you know, technologies and the industry there as well. If you look at the renewable energy, uh, look at, of course, AI, digital technologies, uh, you know, uh, the modern machinery manufacturing, uh, among others there. So China has been pretty much on the track to deliver that. So today, if you look at all the numbers that as a particular look at the renewable energy, so China has pretty much leading, you know, contributing 50 percent of the global installation last year of renewable energy, particular solar and wind. If you look at the sales of the EVs and uh, China probably contributed about 60 percent. If you look at the manufacturing production perspective, China has been contributing about maybe somewhere 70, 80, 90 percent of the industrial value chain contribution there as well. Uh, so China has been pretty much on the track uh, to deliver more, which is really fascinating. Dalian offers an opportunity somehow on one side to ex re-examine the milestones really to, to offer the confidence and also offer the experience and the cases there. But in the meantime, as we've been discussing here today as well, uh, you know, uh, the, the bigger contest there is getting more complicated, particular headwinds. Look at the geopolitical, geoeconomic challenges there. So more than ever, policymakers, the business community need to somehow come together to really understand what the headwinds are, challenges are, and very importantly, how to work together in order to really overcome those headwinds and really accelerate the clean energy revolution there. At this moment, I think the case has already made. We have solutions. We have cost-effective, uh, you know, affordable solutions there. 
if we do not overcome the geopolitical, geoeconomic uh, barriers there, it's going to be really, really hard for the global community to deliver the climate commitments uh, on one side to mitigate the climate change and very more importantly, actually, to figure out how to enhance our climate resilience. Those are the key topics actually pretty much examined here in Dalian in the last couple of days. Andy Mock, of course, uh Artificial intelligence also dominated those talks in Dalian at the summer Davos. Uh, in fact, generative AI is expected to add between 2.6 and 4.4 trillion dollars in annual value uh, to the global economy. That's according to a report that was uh, produced by McKinsey. How much of a game changer will AI be for the global economy? Well, Anon, I think there's a lot of excitement and attention paid to generative AI, but there are other forms of AI that I think will have an even bigger impact on China's development and global development. So China has, of course, emphasized all types of AI, but in particular prioritized industrial applications, uh, especially in areas uh, such as so-called smart manufacturing or lights out factories where uh, little if no human intervention is required. And I think this really, because we all humans uh, live in the real world and not the digital world. So generative AI uh, is primarily focused on creating text, uh, images, audio uh, that are all digital in nature, uh, and some might call disembodied artificial intelligence. Uh, whereas we see China's prioritization, again, I think this is very practical and pragmatic, is how do we use artificial intelligence to improve the lives of people around the world in a sustainable way? So I think this is very, very important. Uh, related to this is uh, advances in 5G, because we know that um, internet access, increasingly access to artificial intelligence, uh, will be through some sort of mobile network. And I just want to share a couple of statistics on this. So according to Graham Allison at the Belfer Center at Harvard University, in 2022, China already had built 1 million 5G base stations compared to 100,000 in the U.S. And it had invested $50 billion in 5G compared to an authorized number of 1.5 billion in the U.S. And today, uh, China has almost 4 million 5G base stations installed. And this is a vital new form of infrastructure, I think, that will lay the groundwork uh, for new models of growth uh, that we are only beginning to uh, see and starting to imagine. And Andy, that's 5G, but in terms of uh, AI and the technology uh, that that uh, calls for. Uh, where is China there? How much of a priority is developing new AI technology? Well, I think it absolutely is a top priority, Anand. Um, so China, of course, aspires, I think is well on its way uh, to being uh, one of the global leaders uh, in technology from a full spectrum perspective, whether that's life sciences, whether that's computing technology, whether that's material sciences, space exploration. And AI uh, is generally considered what's called a general purpose technology, like electricity, like steam, uh, that it powers every other form of innovation. So it, of course, can uh, make uh, information processing uh, more effective, uh, as I mentioned, with industrial automation, uh, the integration of AI with robotics. We can build things more quickly, more cheaply, at higher quality. Um, but it also has uh, vital national security implications as well. And another part I want to touch on here, too, is this also points to an underappreciated form of technology that I think China leads in, and that's political technology. One of the areas I think that uh, China uh, has demonstrated enormous competence in is advanced conceptual thinking when it comes to political decision making. And artificial intelligence, I think, can play a very, very powerful role here as well. And that's something I would be paying more attention to uh, as we look at how this AI revolution unfolds. Yeah, and it's something we'd like to hear more about as well. Anna Tangan, uh, CGTN's Chin Chen Chin uh, spoke to Dora Liu. She's the CEO of Deloitte China. She talked about China's economy. Let's listen to part of their conversation. China as the market and the economy is too big, too important, and too good to ignore. 
So that's the consensus. Definitely, there are complexities, but compared with the complexity, um, the opportunities are much more. So the reason behind why we were all so confident uh, of uh, China's economy is exactly as uh, what uh, Premier Li Qiang mentioned and pointed out. First and foremost, uh, the mega size of a digital economy, uh, the uh, huge amount of uh, user cases, uh, and uh, the innovation, the pivotal, uh, uh, the uh, the power of uh, innovation, innovation hub. And second is the talent pool. And third is China has been keeping advocating uh, the open door policy. So, Ina, uh, according to Xinhua, more than 21,000 foreign investment firms were established in China. That's in the first five months of this year, and that's an increase of 17.4 percent year on year. Um, so, you know, listening to Premier Li's speech, then what he talked about China being open for business. I mean, is the message finally getting through that China is now definitely open for business? Yeah, it's getting there. I mean, there's there's still little hiccups and things like that, and the government appears to be trying to iron them out, uh, and and that's what's really important. I mean, and I've noticed, uh, you know, everywhere I go, as uh, you know, offices where they were polite before are actually um, more polite and uh, much more welcoming. Uh, they'll say something to me in English and things like that. Um, but you know, what she was appointed to is the reality. Where where are you going to invest money these days? I mean, uh, Europe is anemic. The U.S is unsettled. Uh, there are other places, especially Southeast Asia, but if you're looking for a large mass of uh, consumers, uh, China is definitely where you want to be, and th that's going to continue, and that, that was really the message that uh, taken away from there. I would like to add one uh, other issue, is that this was a very important window, uh, bringing these people from 100 countries. Um, and bringing them together to see Dalian and to be in China, especially after you know so many years of COVID and isolation, uh, very, very important in terms of people-to-people -people exchange, because you, you can talk about the message, but it's much more impactful when you're actually seeing it. John Quelch, uh, China's economy grew by 5.3% in the first quarter, and the outlook for the second quarter is very positive. Um, I mean, you know, these are the numbers. I mean, we have to look at some of the intangible things like business confidence as well. I mean, what are you hearing? What are you seeing from the business community uh, in terms of, you know, their confidence that we will continue to see this steady growth? I think it's uh, industry specific. And, and I mean, if uh, you are an entrepreneur uh, operating in one of the uh, uh, key areas uh, for Chinese uh, economic growth, as indicated earlier, uh, AI, uh, biomedicine, and uh, green tech, for example, um, then I think you're in a position where you can be extremely confident about uh, the support you're going to receive and about the opportunities, both domestically and uh, internationally. Um, obviously, if you're in uh, an industry such as the uh, the property sector or industries that depend upon uh, new construction for their health, uh, then it's a little bit uh, less uh, optimistic. So I do think it's varying by industry, but I think that generally speaking, the level of uh, entrepreneurial enthusiasm is on the rebound. And uh, Premier Lee's uh, speech certainly was encouraging to uh, the delegates uh, who were present. I might just add in addition that um, as an example of the uh, outreach and global cooperation effort, uh, by China at the moment, uh, the heads of state of both Poland and Vietnam, uh, two very important countries in the uh, the roster of emerging economies, they were present at the uh, forum in Dalian, and I think uh, gave very powerful messages themselves about the uh, opportunities they see in the global south, if I can put it that way, for economic development and cooperation with uh, China. And the, the chairman of uh, McKinsey in China, Joe Ngai, uh, he described China this way, and he said, China is the most competitive environment in the world, especially when it comes to innovation. Let's listen to some of that. I think China is definitely the most competitive uh, environment anywhere on, on, you know, globally. And I think for multinationals, this is the market where they face the fiercest 
local competition, mm. they face the fiercest price competition, right? And they face the most rapid innovation cycle mm. that they can see anywhere else, right? Product innovation in China, you know, is three times faster than anywhere they've seen usually in the home markets. So Andy, how is uh, China driving innovation and, and what kind of opportunities does that present, not just for China, but for the entire world? Sure. No, I completely agree with uh, Joe Nye on this, um, both intellectually as well as anecdotally. So, you know, let me start with a couple of numbers um, because it really starts with smart, highly trained people. China graduates something like 3.6 million STEM graduates a year. Uh, which is more than four times that of the U.S. The U.S. graduates something like 800,000. Um, and of course, China and the U.S. are the two uh, global technology leaders uh, currently. So it all starts with talent, but I think it also starts with uh, government policy as well. So without the right policies, and I touched on this earlier, that I think China approaches these problems from a rational scientific perspective, what I would uh, characterize as advanced conceptual thinking, uh, that develops policies that can be applied across a broad and diverse country. So with, with that in place, um, I think this uh, provides fertile ground for entrepreneurs to flourish. I think the other aspect that Joe and I talked about, about the uh, ferociously competitive environment in China is absolutely correct. I think of it as China is like a high gravity planet. And if you adapt and can thrive here, uh, you can certainly do well uh, in lower gravity environments uh, in other parts uh, of the world. And I think we've seen this uh, take place uh, with electric vehicles, of course, solar panels, um, even areas that once uh, investors around the world thought it would be impossible for China to succeed in, and that is consumer-facing cultural products. And here I'm talking, of course, about TikTok, uh, which has dominated markets around the world uh, most impressively, I think, uh, in the United States. So uh, when we look at all of these factors together, um, I think that uh, China is uh, incredibly well positioned. I want to make one other quick point about this, too, to uh, share the importance of digital infrastructure, in particular 5G. So to use an example that I think many uh, for, uh, for the people in our audience that are in the U.S. might appreciate, uh, when the U.S. Uh, built out its interstate highway system under President Eisenhower, this not only drove economic growth directly by making it easier, cheaper, faster for people and goods to be moved around the country. But it also opened up vast new business models that no one had imagined previously, like motels instead of yeah. hotels, uh, gas stations, uh, strip malls, uh, and really drove the whole suburbanization of the United States uh, that transformed uh, the character of the country. So I think, again, we're witnessing uh, this investment in different kinds of infrastructure in China, high-speed rail, but also, I think, uh, 5G that will open up uh, vast new business models and opportunities, not just for China, but for people all around the world. Chang Wabu, the World Economic Forum uh, also produced a white paper, and that white paper is called Transforming Energy Demand. Uh, and it shows that energy consumption can be reduced by almost a third, 31% is the number, by taking steps in key sectors like buildings, like uh, construction, like industry, like transport. Um, what can you tell us about this? Sure, let me put things in perspective. I think yeah. a key message uh, that's communicated loud and clear from Dalian is that it's a quality growth, right? And uh, what, what do we mean quality growth? There are a few key dimensions to define that. One is you know, innovation, the second one is productivity, the third one is modernization and uh, security as well as uh, you know, sustainability. So if, if you put things in perspective, of course, we do need to employ uh, and, uh, you know, all the technology possible. From an energy perspective, uh, you know, yes, we've been making progress in terms of improving energy efficiency. That's been very important part of the solution. And we are still facing a lot of challenges there and opportunities there. We have to adopt new technologies, particular digitalization, automation technologies to do so. 
Now, related to that, actually, is also uh, replace, right? We, we've been making efforts to substitute the fossil fuels and replace that part uh, with the renewable energies, particularly solar and the wind. And then, of course, if you look at mo electrification of different sectors, including buildings and mo mobilities there, somehow, you know, you put all the solutions together, we are definitely making huge progress in terms of managing the energy demand. And rather than continuously to, you know, to rise, to, to have the energy demand rising, we will be able to much manage, better manage the energy demand. In the meantime, really put the demand and supply and the energy system that's built, you know, on the top of renewable energy system there. That's really fascinating progress. We've been made so far and we continue, we need to continue mm -hmm. to put the, all the efforts, you know, including technology, industrial value chain, um, markets of financing together. And on top of, of that, actually, we need much stronger policy incentives as well in order to achieve the bigger agenda. John Qualsh with the developing world still feeling the effects uh, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, they're also struggling with servicing debt as well as inflation worries. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, to what extent will Chinese growth be key to driving global economic growth uh, this year? Uh, well, uh, the uh, United States is looking uh, pretty anemic relative to uh, China uh, at around about two and a half percent economic growth this year. And uh, uh, the World Bank forecast for 2025 is not encouraging with respect to uh, U.S. economic growth. Uh, it'll be lower, according to the World Bank, than this year's figure. So uh, China's role in terms of driving uh, global economic growth, uh, as Ina indicated earlier, uh, China accounts for 30 plus percent of uh, economic growth each year in the world. That's going to continue, probably be even higher in 2025, given the uh, sluggish uh, recovery in the U.S. So. When you are a uh, country in the global south and you are looking at who to collaborate with, who is going to help you uh, drive your own economy forward, uh, it's not surprising that there is uh, a, a considerable interest in uh, China. And uh, every day, practically, in Beijing, we see another, econ another political leader from another country from the global south right. uh, visiting to learn how they can cooperate uh, for the benefit of their economy and their people with China. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us on the show. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Knight in Washington, D.C.